So uh, Dr. Fairbanks is not able to be here today, but Dr. Peterson uh, is here able to give her talk. So I will turn this over to you. Do you want to talk a little bit about your background while we get slides? So Dr. Fairbanks can't be here today. She is following um, COVID protocols, had a COVID exposure. She's totally fine, but wants to be as safe as possible for all of you. So I'm here today instead. I am a postdoctoral research associate in Dr. Fairbanks's lab. Um, and I can talk a little bit from a different perspective. I am not the PI of the lab. I'm a postdoctoral associate, which means that I have my PhD. I completed my doctorate, and I'm still working in research after the completion of the doctorate. Um, a little bit of background about me. I got my undergraduate degree in neuroscience, and my PhD is in experimental and clinical pharmacology. So I combine those together, and we study neuropharmacology, or how drugs interact with the nervous system. So we come at the um, questions, the same types of questions that you've heard from the previous speakers with a little bit of a different approach where we are looking to change things through pharmacology, through the application of drugs rather than the application of magnets or the application of stimulation or things like that. Um, so what was your favorite topic in high school? My favorite topic in high school? Um, I did not enjoy high school. <laughs> I uh, did post, um, what's it called, post-secondary enrollment options, or PSEO, because I did not enjoy my high school at all. So I came here to the University of Minnesota instead of taking my high school classes because um, high school is not the place for me. All right. Okay, so here's a picture of Carolyn as a child and a picture of her as an adult so you can see what her face looks like. If you have any questions about our lab, um, either Carolyn or I would be very happy to answer those going forward. Um, we always love talking with students. Okay, so what our lab focuses on is chronic pain or chronic pain patients. And we look at this from a few different perspectives where Everyone talks about the opioid epidemic, everyone talks about overdose epidemic, everyone talks about um, opioid overdose, but we um, look at the pandemic as a two-pronged pandemic or having two facets to it, where in America especially and throughout the world, we have record numbers of people who are experiencing chronic pain or who are in chronic pain, um, and they seek treatment for the pain state that they're in, and sometimes this um, can lead to divergence of the medication. This can lead to addiction from the medications. Um, and one strategy to approaching the overdose epidemic is to change the types of pain treatments that we are giving to people, or change the types of medications that we are giving to people. So. Um, I'm very sorry, I was only asked to do this last night, so I do not have the talk down as Carolyn had the talk down, but this is a slide that was made for Carolyn by the University of Minnesota, and it talks about the different ways that we can target chronic pain. Chronic pain is a maladaptive sensory experience, and pain in general is something that's informative to us, so if you put your hand on a hot stove, you need to have information that, that is, the stove is going to damage your hand and you need to remove your hand. So pain isn't inherently a bad thing. The problem comes when your body doesn't understand that there's nothing wrong, but is still telling you that you're in pain. So that would be something like you have a back that gives you pain, um, you have chronic migraines, migraines aren't giving you information about the state of your world that you need to change the state of your world. Um, so this is uh, an illustration of the different places that we can target pain information before it reaches the brain and you have the sensory experience of pain. So we have out here in the periphery, let's see if I can get the, oh, here we go. Out here in the periphery, we have nerve endings and nerve endings are looking for information to see what is the state of your environment and do I need to change anything about my environment. We have that information traveling along your nerves and entering the spinal cord and the spinal cord integrates all of the pain signals and all of the sensory information 
from your periphery and it sends that information up to the brain and the brain has many different locations where it interprets the pain signals from the periphery. So we have information entering from the periphery being sent up to the brain and the brain does a whole bunch of calculations to say what is the state of the environment that I'm in? Am I experiencing pain? Am I not experiencing pain? The most classically used pain relievers are oftentimes opioids. And opioids bind to opioid receptors. Um, can I ask how many people are familiar with receptors? Oh, OK. So receptors sit on your cell membranes. And um, different drugs that we have bind to the receptor. And then the receptor sends information into the cell to change the behavior of the cell based on what information it's receiving from the drugs that it binds, that bind to the receptor. So this is um, a mu opioid receptor. It might also be called MOR, um, M-O-R is a way you may have seen that represented. And opioids, including fentanyl, including morphine, including carfentanyl, all of the classic things that you've heard about um, in discussions about the opioid epidemic bind to this receptor but one interesting thing is that they, different drugs that bind to this receptor cause the receptor to give different information to the cell, and the cell reacts differently based on what is bound to the receptor. Is anyone familiar with the opioid overdose rescue drug, naloxone? Naloxone works by also binding to this receptor and preventing these drugs from binding to the receptor and giving information to the rest of the cell that there are opioids in the receptor. So naloxone binds here, all of the opioids bind here, um, and this is one major part of what we study in the lab. The interesting thing about mu opioid receptors and about any receptor for any drug, for any target, for any disease, is that they're spread all throughout the body. So it would be very convenient for us if we had a receptor that only existed in one location that was along the pain pathway, and then we could stop that information from being transmitted along the pain pathway, and we would have a pain relief without any side effects. But one of the main principles of pharmacology and the main principles of drug treatment and drug therapy is you have the receptors located along the pathways that you're interested in changing, but you also have receptors located in locations um, that could be detrimental or have an opposite effect of the effect you're trying to have with your therapeutic. So for the mu opioid receptor, um, if you, oh, I went back too far. If you look here, this is called a synapse, and a synapse is when one neuron talks to another neuron. So here we have our neurons from the periphery, and they're entering the spinal cord. And most, or not most, but a lot of our research focuses on this synapse right here. So we have the information from the periphery, and we want to stop that information from going up to the spinal cord, up to the brain. So we want to stop pain before it even reaches your brain. Your brain doesn't have to know about it, um, and your spinal cord doesn't send the information up to the brain. The cool thing is that mu opioid receptors, so the receptors that are um, responsible for pain relief, the receptors that all of the opioid drugs bind to are found here in this synapse. It's called a first order synapse because it's the first synapse from your periphery on your way to your brain. And what you see here in white is a representation of where those mu opioid receptors are found on your spinal cord, which is awesome. That means that this is a target that we can try and get our drugs to this location in the body to prevent signaling from happening via these receptors. However, we also have mu opioid receptors found in other places, including the brain stem. So if you know about opioid overdose deaths, you know that the cause of death from opioid overdose deaths is respiratory depression or the lack of ability to breathe. 
So we also find new opioid receptors in the brainstem, and that's the reason why you can have a drug that gives you pain relief, and it gives you pain relief from preventing those pain signals from getting to the brain, but it also causes respiratory depression by the same mechanism where the drugs are binding to those new opioid receptors located in your brainstem and preventing you from being able to breathe. So that leads to our research. And we look at the chronic pain crisis and the opioid crisis from many different strategies. We have many different lines of investigation that we're working on all the time. We collaborate with many different departments at the University of Minnesota to come up with these different strategies. But I'll briefly talk about the strategies that we um, go through. So the first is to develop non-opioid pain relievers. So that would be pain relievers that don't rely on this new opioid receptor, and that would help us bypass the effects like addiction, the effects like respiratory depression, um, and we don't even have to worry about those because we're using drugs that don't interact with those receptors. The other super cool um, research that we do is looking at low opioid combinations where we give two drugs at the same time and they have what's called a synergistic interaction. So if you give two drugs and they have a larger effect than just one drug given individually, that means that we can give very low doses of those two drugs instead of a higher dose of one drug. And this is a concept called therapeutic window, where you have a window of safe doses of a drug, and then once you go above that window, you start getting your side effects. So with combination therapies, we can give two drugs at lower doses, stay inside our therapeutic window where it's safe for patients, and they don't have these risks of side effects. We also have collaborated with um, the Department of Medicinal Chemistry to develop opioids that can't cross the blood-brain barrier. And that means that the drugs would stay in your periphery and it would stay at the receptors um, out here. And the drug wouldn't be able to get into the brain. The brain is what's called a privileged organ, which means that all of the um, surrounding the brain, there are special receptors and special barriers that keep extra stuff out. We don't want a whole bunch of stuff getting into our brain. Our brain is very delicate in some ways. So the brain has its own inherent barrier where some things are allowed in, but not everything is allowed in. So we would want to use that principle to develop drugs that only stay out here and talk to the receptors out here and the drugs can't get into the brain, so we wouldn't be worried about them binding in the brainstem, them having respiratory depression, addiction, all of those things. How am I doing on time? A few minutes, okay. So another cool thing that we do is we work with gene therapy, and this is something that more and more people have heard of because of the new um, coronavirus vaccines. Some of them are gene therapy vaccines, but we use gene therapy in a different way where we deliver the gene therapy and the gene therapy is packaged to contain information to tell the cell, make more of this specific enzyme, and the enzyme then inherently creates um, a compound called agmatine, and agmatine is an analgesic or a pain-relieving drug. So we're giving the cells information to create their own medication, basically, where you would receive one injection, one gene therapy injection, instead of needing to take a pill every single day because we're telling your body how to create the analgesic itself instead of delivering the analgesic over and over again. So this is a representation. A lot of gene therapies have what's called a fluorescent protein or a green fluorescent protein. And that's a marker that it fluoresces, it lights up, so we can see where the gene therapy has gone after it's injected. And this is work that Dr. Fairbanks and other collaborators here at the University of Minnesota did when they were initially looking at gene therapy where they injected the gene therapy 
And then we get to look through microscopes and look at the cells and see what cell types have picked up that gene therapy and started expressing this fluorescent protein to know what cell types are targeted and to know um, how we're targeting the gene therapy that we're making. This is just a picture that Carolyn loves a whole bunch, so it's not very scientifically informative, but she really loves this illustration where if you remember me talking about the periphery going into the spinal cord, this is um, the fluorescent protein expressing and fluorescing these tracks that go from the periphery and then they come up here to the first order of the spinal cord. So this is just an illustration of the anatomy of the situation going from the periphery to the spinal cord. And let's see, um, this is a, uh, it's called a von Frey graph. And a von Frey filament is a filament that you apply to a specific area, sorry, you apply the filament to a specific area and someone who is in pain will be able to tolerate less of that filament application than someone who's not in pain. So if you think about a sunburn, normally you can touch your arm just fine, but if your arm has a sunburn, it would be very noxious to have someone come up and like slap you on the arm. So what we do is we measure that in grams of force, and up here, 14 stands for 14 grams of application with no issues, no painful response, and down here, zero to two means that you're only able to apply two grams of force before a painful response. And this is a demonstration of a reversal of the hypersensitivity following gene therapy. So if you don't have treatment, you stay at that two grams of force the whole time. If you have the gene therapy, over time, you become less and less painful. And together, we are building a future where addiction is no longer a public health crisis. So that's what we're working on. Do you have any questions for me? Yes. Oh, do I give you? I think so. <laughs> um, so I have heard just Sorry. that, um, you know, they've known for quite some time that opioids have the potential to be addicting, and even though it's only been a handful of years since we've called it a crisis, have you found in your world and talking to other scientists that since it's been labeled a crisis, you have been able to get more funding and support for finding alternatives um, or researching further into how it works within the body? Um, we've always been very lucky to have steady funding, but there has been more and more initiatives, more and more money, more and more approaches to addressing the public health crisis. So it is something that um, overall, yes, there is more research into this area. And we have definitely um, been thankful and grateful that we're not scrambling for funding anywhere um, because this is a problem that definitely needs addressing. OK, we have another question. Does this research help for people who are already dealing with addiction and stuff and like other problems related to opioid, opioids and addiction to help them like kind of get away from their addiction? So our lab has many different lines of research into the analgesic side of things, but we also directly study addiction. So we um, have multiple lines of just analgesic study and then we also study addiction, what's happening in your brain when you're addicted to something, and developing treatments that people can have if they are already addicted to opioids, and how do we prevent that or reverse that after they experience that? Yes. Does your group or your research, have you talked to doctors and people saying just let's quit administering opioids in general, and let's just go down this path and just be done with them and find other alternatives? So the strange thing is, um, as they were talking about in, with the previous speaker, is that some people fully benefit from opioids. They're incredibly analgesic. They don't experience the side effects. And then other people with different genetics and different brains maybe either don't experience the benefits of opioids, don't experience analgesia, they um, are more likely to convert to addiction, to convert to misuse. Um, 
So it's another line that many different labs are working on are who is predisposed to addiction versus who is less likely to experience addiction and more likely to experience the relief from opioids because opioids are the most powerful tool that we have for analgesia. They've been used forever, right? Um, and they are more effective than many, many, many other classes of drugs. So a lot of people um, want to keep the benefits of opioids without the risk of these side effects. And that's one thing that we're working on with the opioid combinations and with peripheral opioids, so opioids that can't even reach the brain. Um, and then other people, or we are also working on non-opioid approaches depending on the individual person. So pharmacogenomics especially are looking at people who are more likely to um, convert to addiction than others. So it's a multifaceted approach, a multidisciplinary approach. It's very um, collaborative. So it, there are many, many different research areas moving forward on how to address that, yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Peterson. Let's Thank you. give it up for her. <laughs>